Hello students, I'm Dr. Cecilia Kimani and I'm going to take you through the unit Introduction to Exceptional Children which is the same as Introduction to Special Education. We'll start by looking at the expected outcomes. So by the end of this lesson, we, this course, we, the students would be expected to be able to define the term exceptional children, be able to differentiate uh, categories of uh, exceptional children. Uh, they'll also be able to assess different characteristics of exceptional children. They'll be expected also to explain causes leading to children being termed as exceptional. And finally, they should be able to identify and discuss inter invention, intervention measures for different uh, categories. I'll then take you through the course content. The course content will be looking at the historical development of special education, the definition of an exceptional child and terms used uh, in relation to exceptionality. We will also uh, go through causes of disabilities and special educational needs. We will also look at the categories of learners with exceptionalities and their characteristics. And finally, as we look at the different categories, we'll be looking at the educational interventions for each category so that we know as teachers, what are we expected to do to assist these learners. Now we'll start with lesson one. Lesson one is about historical development of special education. We would uh, like to you to understand the origin of special education. Where did it start up to where we are today? So previously, before the 1940s, in the developed countries, uh, children who would be born with uh, disabilities would be put in institutions. And that became a period where we were talking about children with disabilities being institutionalized. It was the period of institutionalization where children were seen not to fit within the normal society and instead they would be kept separately. They would not live with their parents, but they would be put in institutions where they would only be fed and the idea was just for survival. There was nothing like learning, there was nothing like any interventions. It was all about keeping them away from the society and putting them together because they were seen not to be uh, like others and therefore they were put in those institutions just for survival. But in the 1948, I believe you all know what happened in 1948, Universal Declaration of Human Rights came about in 1948 and Article 1, Article 7 and Article 26 of the Universal Declaration of Human Rights look at um, everybody as equal, everybody having a right uh, to be treated the same, uh, especially Article 7 is talking about non-discrimination and Article 26 talks about the right to education for every human being. And after 1948, when 1950s came about, 1960s, most parents now realize that their children should not be where they are because they need to be treated just like any other human being. And therefore, they chose to keep their children at home and they would not take them to the institutions. But within that time, that period, those 10 years, a lot happened. Civil rights movements came about. And as a result of that, laws and attitudes on discrimination, it was about, actually, the, 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 the civil um, rights movements were talking about the, the, the legal position in terms of minorities, where children with disabilities were considered as uh, minorities, and therefore, people started seeing that their children should not be treated the way they were treated and they would really go by the human rights um, uh, articles and declarations regarding every human being. And as a result of that, in 1954, there was a case, a court case, between a, a one person called Brown versus Board of Education in the US. And after this case, uh, the, the Board of Education lost uh, the case, and therefore after the case, there was a, a shift in attitude, whereby uh, 
it was felt that even those with disabilities, children with disabilities, should also be given opportunities to go to school. And therefore, at that particular time, it was felt that, yes, they need to be taken to school because the, 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 the Board of Education lost. And when now they were taken to those schools, the concept of normalization came in. Normalization here means trying to, trying to make those children with disabilities do the same things that those without disabilities do, making them normal. They were seeing as if they are abnormal, but they were looking at ways of mending that what they were missing. If they were physically handicapped, they would think of what to do with that handicap. If they were blind, what they would do with their eyes. So in an attempt of making them appear normal. But again, in the 1970s, to where we are now, um, another shift came about, but more so in the 1970s after the children were taken to those schools, uh, where it was felt that again, these children, when they are put in these schools, because they were now taken to special schools, that um, they are being segregated. So there, there has been creation of new laws, especially in the developed world, and only limited access to the education system was offered to those children as a result of uh, that case where um, the Board of Education in America lost. Then in 1975, as a result of the, of the, of the case, there was this law very popular law known as an American law, actually, known as the Public Law 94-142, Education for All Handicapped Act. It started as an act, and then it is now a law. And this law uh, stressed so much on free, appropriate public education to every child with a disability. It became a law, and it has developed with time, we'll see this later. So the law then in 1975 emphasized special education and related services uh, should be designed to meet the unique needs of all those children with disabilities. And therefore now special education came about where they were put into special schools. They, did not, they were not put in the same school, uh, schools with the others. And while they were in those schools, the main intention was to, to, to really be able to address their many different needs, very diverse needs. You can imagine a blind child in, in school, a deaf child in school, and it was as a result of this that they had to really think, how does this blind child write? How does he read? How does this child who is deaf learn in class? And therefore, issues like Braille came about, sign language came about, but they were now learning in their own different schools. But with time again, it was felt that their children are being discriminated against. Why are they not learning with the other learners? Why are they being segregated? And as a result of that, again, because of the same uh, declaration on human rights, which says there should be no discrimination, again, the law had to be changed a bit, the same uh, public law, where they felt that now that people are arguing that their children are being put in separate schools, we need to put them together with the others in the same regular schools. And at this time now, the law focused so much more on bringing these children who are in special schools into the regular schools to learn with the others. And this is why now the law started being referred to as mainstreaming act. Because when you, when you put learners with disabilities together with those without disabilities, they are all, you, you, we actually talk about putting them in the mainstream system. So mainstreaming in special needs means that learners with disabilities and without disabilities are all learning in the same class, in the same school. But again, uh, there was this shift, shift to edu educating children is where we are talking about now they were put in this classroom. But we need to note here that when they were put in these classrooms, there was nothing extra that was being done to assist these learners. They were only put together in those classrooms. There, were, there was nothing like focusing on an individual learner with a disability, say for example, a learner who is deaf in the same classroom with those who are not. If they, they, they focused on such a learner, 
it was felt that again they are being segregated, they are being discriminated against. So they, were, they just stayed in those classes, but nothing much was happening to help them uh, to, to, to address the diverse special needs, uh, learning needs that they had. So this, the participation of these learners in the regular uh, education in those uh, mainstream schools was very, very minimal, and it was noted that they were not doing as best or as well as they were in the special schools. So the public law, public law 94142 has currently gone through a lot of changes, a, a lot of uh, review and, uh, and revision and so much has been added and it has now uh, been referred to as the IDEA or IDEA, it's popularly referred to as IDEA, but stands for Individuals with Disabilities Education Act. But we need to note here that all this is happening in America. Americans are the, are the ones who started all this, and the rest of the world, including ourselves here in Kenya, we've been going by what the Americans have been doing since it started off as a country, but the rest of the countries have been coping. And you can imagine, at least those years, 1970s and 1960s, we were very, very behind here in Kenya in terms of education for learners with special needs. Now, since then, here we had, we got schools that were being referred to as integrated schools. Actually, some of them are still around. They have that uh, name as integrated schools, where you find uh, students or learners with disabilities learning in the same schools, managing their way through. And what I want us to understand is that when we talk about integration or mainstreaming, we are talking about the learner fighting his or her way through. No, nothing extra is being done by the education system, by the school, by the parents, to help them be at the same level with those without disabilities. It's for them to survive. It's for them to work their way through in, class, in the classroom, outside the classroom. Nobody really felt that they needed to, to be given any extra intervention to be able to, need, to meet their um, diverse educational needs. But in 1994, there was this World Conference on Special Needs Education, which focused on access and quality of education. And the focus was strictly on special needs education, education for learners with special needs, because it was felt that wherever they were, they were not achieving the highest potential. They were not really getting the best that they could. And therefore, when they didn't learn as much, it was not because their brains were not able to, but it was because of the learning environment where they were learning. So UNESCO organized this, and it is good to note that in 1994, education for uh, learners with disabilities was taken over by a global body, the body that takes charge of uh, education. So this conference was uh, um, attended by 95 countries, and Kenya was one of them, we were represented. And at that um, conference, it was agreed that we will not now be just talking about learners with, with, uh, with disabilities, that there are others who may not be having visible disabilities, but they are having educational needs of some kind. So um, the education now that was being offered to learners with disabilities started being referred to as special, those learners with special educational needs. And special educational needs, as we shall see later, are more than just disabilities. And that is why today we don't talk about education for children with disabilities, we talk about those with disabilities and special needs, because there are other needs that are outside disabilities, but they are educational needs. Um, and then, at the conference, the issue of inclusive education was discussed. And it was agreed at that conference that now we need to move away from integration and go to inclusive education. What is this inclusive education? You shall also be seeing that uh, more. It meant that education should still be offered in the regular school, the school nearest to the learner, the school of choice to the learner or the parents of the learner. And in these regular schools, they should not be the ones surviving or fighting their way through. They should be um, 
the, the, the pedagogy, the edu um, teaching strategies, uh, resources, and all that should be child-centered. Not just for those learners with disabilities or special needs, but for every learner in that classroom. So that was one main thing, that no more education in special schools. All learners with special needs and disabilities should learn in the regular schools with their peers who do, who do not have any special needs and disabilities, and they should be offered a child-centered pedagogy that, will, that, is, or that was seen at that conference as capable of su successfully educating all children together. And inclusive education talks about all children, not just those with special needs or disabilities, but all of them benefiting from whatever type of education is being offered in that uh, regular school. The other thing was that uh, it was seen it would provide quality education, and this quality education would not just be for those with disabilities, but also for all the other children who are in those classrooms. It was also felt that this education would also change the discriminatory attitudes, where people feel this one cannot manage here because he, 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 he has a wheelchair. This one cannot fit in here because he cannot talk or he cannot hear, when we don't know sign language, those kind of attitudes or cannot fit in here, how are we going to deal with this person because he can't see? So it was felt that this inclusive education would change those attitudes, very discriminatory attitudes, where you're looking at the defect or that what one is missing and you're not seeing what they have and what they can make with that what they have. And then also it was felt that it would create very welcoming communities. What does this mean? Here we are having young children right from early childhood uh, classrooms learning those with disabilities and those without, those with special needs and those without in the same classrooms. And they grow up with these children together where those without are able to appreciate those with special needs. Those with special needs are also able to appreciate those without and be able to live together because a time will come when they will leave school. They will not be in school together uh, through, uh, forever. So if you think about children who go to special schools, they go to schools where they, they all look the same. If they are deaf, they are all deaf. If they are, have a visual impairment, they are blind, they are all like that. Those with physical handicaps, they are all like that. Like the school just next to us here, Joy Town, we also have a speaker school for the blind, where they are all the same. By the time they leave, they finish Form 4 and they go to that school when they went to nursery school, or PP1, as we're calling it today, they will not be able to fit in the community. Because the communi and the community also will not be able to embrace them because they have not lived with them. But when we put them together in the schools right from the time they go to school to the time they finish, they will be able to understand and appreciate one another. Both parties will appreciate one another and they'll be able to live in harmony. So inclusive education was seen to be able to create welcoming communities. And by creating welcoming communities, we are also developing an inclusive society, a society of people globally who appreciate those with disabilities and without disabilities, and those uh, and the special needs and those without are able to appreciate uh, the others and therefore we will now be able to even to embrace them even after school when they come to us they are knocking to our into our offices looking for a job we are able to say yes we know they are able and we can give them uh, the job that they want but above all is the fact that so much is done to be able to accommodate them in inclusive education a lot is done within the the society within the education uh, setting, whether it's a school, even whether it's a university like this one, uh, where we feel that there are people who are different from us and they will require this or that. Where there are stairs, we need a lift because there are people who may not be able to, to, to climb the stairs. So we develop um, an inclusive society and we are able to embrace, both parties are able to embrace the other party. Now, causes of disabilities and special needs. What causes this? And today we are going to look at in childhood, not really 
other things like road accidents. We've been thinking of why is a child, how does a child find himself or herself with a disability or a special need? The major um, cause number one is genetic factors. Among the genetic factors, we talk about fragile X syndrome. This causes developmental delays. It can cause behavioral issues. It is known to cause autism, which is also one of the special needs that is emerging so much recently. It was not there before so much, but now we are hearing of autism. And fragile X syndrome is, is, is a chromosome X, which is fragile as it is called. It is weak, and therefore it does not uh, serve its purpose as it should. And as a result of that, it now affects the brain development and brings about those kind of... Uh, uh, issues that could be a disability, could be just a special need, but it affects the brain. And then we have phenylketonuria, popularly known as FK, uh, PKU. This is excess phenylal phenylalanine. Phenyl phenylalanine is a, a form of an amino acid. When it is excess again, it affects the brain and it, it causes brain damage and mostly fragile X and phenylketonuria are known for mental retardation, but also other mild um, uh, syndromes like autism. And then we have Down syndrome. It is also a genetic factor. Here again, instead of ha having two copies of chromosome 21, a person gets three copies of chromosome 21. And now that results in developmental delays and mostly it also causes mental retardation. Then we have prenatal illnesses and issues. This is before the child is born. And one common one is the resource factor. Resource factor is about blood. It talks about its RH factor. It's about red blood cells, white blood cells, where um, the blood type of a man and the blood type of the woman may lead to a child having this kind of a, a disability or and it can cause in many forms of disabilities can be physical can be blindness can be hearing because it affects the brain but it's all about the blood the blood itself so uh, people are always advised even before they decide to live together as husband and wife to understand their type of blood first whether it can much whether it will it can lead to um, um, abortions uh, not planned abortions and on and also at times it can cause it can make children born to be born with uh, this kind of disabilities and people may not know wh where the problem is but in most cases it's all about the blood makeup then exposure to toxic substances for the mother when she's pregnant when she is exposed to these toxic substances, it, it goes to the child, the unborn child. And we also talk about fetal alcohol syndrome, sometimes alcohol, which, which is uh, toxic. And many other things, and especially stuff that people are using today, young people are using today, they are likely to lead to a child being born with disabilities because whatever we are using out there is toxic and is likely to reach the fetus. The other one is about maternal infection or illnesses. The mother is ill, the mother is sick, and this flows to the unborn child, and the child ends up being born with disabilities or special needs. And then we have the birth defects. A child is just born with birth de defects. It just happens. And um, that, here we are talking about the prenatal before the child is born. And then we have the perinatal. This happens during or immediately preceding the birth. During that short period of birth is the one we refer to as perinatal. And one is birth injuries. When the child is being born, the, 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 the child happens to um, get some injuries in the process, in the handling. Then we have another condition called asphyxia. This is oxygen deprivation. From, from, by the time the child is released from the placenta to the time the child goes out to breathe their own uh, oxygen, if it takes longer than it should, the brain tends to lack oxygen. And when the brain lacks oxygen, 
then it, it, it gets damaged and it leads to mostly mental retardation. If not, it's not so serious, mostly it depends on which part mainly of the brain has been affected by that uh, lack of oxygen. It could be specific parts or the whole brain depending on the seriousness of the oxygen deprivation. Then prematurity, children who are born when they are premature, they are likely to have problems and have uh, disabilities or special needs. We also have childhood illnesses and injuries after they are born. People don't know this, most people don't know this, but meningitis is a very serious uh, illness. It attacks the brain. And when it attacks the brain, it, it really depends on which part of the brain has been, a, has been damaged by the illness, if the illness is not treated on time. And if one doesn't die of meningitis, then they are likely to end up being blind, to end up being deaf, depending on which part of the brain has been affected. And I'm sure soon, you, once you have started this course, you will be doing a unit called neuropsychology, where you understand the brain and you get to know which parts of the brain function in what way. So when I talk about which part of the brain, when you'll be doing that unit, you will understand more what I mean. Then we have encephalitis, is also an infection that affects the brain and inadequate treatment of some diseases. Simple diseases like malaria that is not treated very well, it is likely to lead to uh, disability of some kind or special need. And then we have postnatal causes, uh, which we also refer to as environmental factors. The child is born healthy, but happens to have malnutrition, is not fed well, and doesn't uh, get food that help them to have their brain grow well or their bones or the, whatever parts of their body. And as a result, they can end up having disabilities. And we also have accidental physical trauma to the brain. Accidental physical. Here we are talking about maybe a child falls uh, in the hands of a caregiver or it's hit accidentally by something. It's accidental, but that is likely to lead to a disability or special needs. And then childhood abuse and neglect. We know young babies are abused. We have seen even videos where young babies are abused. Somebody is just angry and is hitting on the kid, is hitting them on the ground, and their brain is being injured. That is likely to cause uh, a disability or even a part of the body as a result of that abuse and neglect. Now, we have come to the end of our lesson one, and uh, we, we, we are going to have an assignment as a result of uh, our lesson one. And question one there reads, what is the difference between integration and inclusive education? And question two, explain two causes of disabilities in children. These televised lectures supplement our robust online learning going on on our MKU online platform. You can view more on our televised lectures via our online platform. We are in a digital era and Mount Kenya University knows this. The following are the steps to follow so as to complete your online application. Download the application form from the website www.mku.ac.ke Attach copies of your academic certificates and ID. Pay the application fees via M-Pesa pay bill number 270988. Your ID is the account number. 2,000 shillings is the charge for a postgraduate. You can also deposit in the bank accounts provided on the website. Then email all the above to apply at mku.ac.ke.